Thank you. Um, yeah, so this uh, will be a discussion talk, basically. Um, we hope we have a productive discussion. Um, so we will show some topics. Uh, the first few topics uh, are things that we think are very important to discuss, and we should really discuss them uh, uh, today. We also have some additional topics uh, in case uh, we need uh, more and uh, you want to continue discussing. So, so the first one is um, that uh, in the last uh, patch series that uh, we sent, uh, we trimmed down the, as you know, the V8, uh, which contained the, the full set of changes that we have produced over the last uh, months um, into, into a into a V9 that is basically a, a very small. Um, concerning the, the kernel crate, which is the crate that contains the, the, all the rust abstraction, abstraction sorry, uh, the code that calls into the, into the C APIs, the code that uh, wraps the, the C APIs into safe abstractions, that is basically what the kernel crate is all about. Uh, and we reduce that from what we have in V8 into, uh, I think it's a, about a 3% of the, of the code. So yeah, it's a fairly minimal set of changes. It could be made more minimal even, uh, but yeah, that's V9. So the first thing we would like to discuss with you is, is there anything else that you would like to see in that past series or V9 is, uh, is good for you? Do you think it should be more minimal, less, et cetera? Oh, yeah, yeah. If not, if nobody sure. says anything, it will be yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so um, over over the past almost two years, uh, what, what we've been doing is uh, uh, working on on adding support to the to the to the build system, and also adding abstractions for for some subsystems, and writing example drivers and and just samples in general. Uh, so what what we did in 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 the latest version of of, of the patch set is is reduce it. Uh, and so most most of the of, of these subsystems uh, are now out of this 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 patch set, um, and part of the reason we want to 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 start upstreaming and pushing these things is to make it easier to to review, because um, part of part of the feedback we got was that uh, the, the 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 patch series was too big, now right, um, but but it is too big because we've spent all this time adding new things to it to try to to demonstrate how one would go about writing certain uh, types of drivers in, in, in Rust. Um, so, so what we're trying to get from, from this question is mostly like, uh, now that we have this, this minimal thing, um, is there anything else you feel that um, uh, we should do or um, would be interesting to, to, to... To make the merits happen, basically. Yeah, to merge it. Um, like if somebody thinks there should be some abstraction uh, that should be there because it's the core, or if somebody thinks the build system needs something else that we need to add, anything really. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Then. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have lots of things. Yeah, we have lots of things. So, so assuming that the, that V9 uh, gets merged, or a V10 or a V11, uh, it's something like that, a minimal series is merged. Um, but you cannot read the full question, but yeah. Uh, what is the expected path for the remaining parts? So the 97% of the things that we didn't submit on the kernel crate from mainly, uh, the 97% through which trees we, we should uh, submit it. Because for example, we have abstractions uh, that Wetson and other people, other contributors wrote uh, that are for a particular subsystem, right? Uh, and we would like that maintainers of that subsystem, the experts on that code on the C side, review the, the Rust code as well, which I think would be, I mean, we, we think it would be the best uh, if we could get the maintainers to, to review it. So should we submit that code through their tree uh, or we should put everything into the Rust tree? Um, basically, we are happy with both uh, options, I think. Uh, both are reasonable especially in the beginning, right? In the beginning, uh, since we mostly wrote the, the, the code. Yeah. I, mean, I guess I would offer some experience based on the documentation tree, which tends to cut across all of the kernel, yeah. as you will eventually do. And what you're gonna find is some maintainers want to carry stuff themselves. Some will want you to do it. You'll always get it wrong. <laughs> and, um, 
and you really just have to learn it on a case by case basis. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that's it's fair. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah fair enough. I, I, I think it will be, speaking purely for myself, I'm not relaying for the chat here. <laughs> um, I, 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 I would want to, as, as a maintainer, I would want to be submitting the Rust code myself through my tree uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one is that I don't actually know any Rust. I'm just really enthusiastic about Rust right now. Uh, I don't know any, and, and obviously I'm going to need to know it. I'm going to need to learn it. That is going to be part of a, of a maintainer's job because the kernel is getting chunks of Rust in it. And if I'm maintaining a subsystem, I'm going to need to know Rust. And so I may as well learn it by reviewing code that other people have written in Rust and think is now ready to be sent upstream. And I mean, you guys are the Rust experts. If you've written it, I'm sure the Rust parts of it are good. What might not be good is how it, what it thinks about the C parts of, of, of my subsystem. But that's the area in which I'm an expert. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I I want to control which bits of Rust that pertain to my subsystem go into the tree. Um, so that, 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 that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that um, you, you don't know my subsystem. Maybe my subsystem's going through some changes and perhaps you've uh, wrapped the old API and I'm trying to move everyone over to the new API. <coughs> you would just never want to expose that old API to Rust drivers ever. So, you know, you, you may have, have made a, a strategic error that you couldn't possibly have known about because I hadn't told you. So yeah. um, I want to take, I, I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. But maybe not everyone's gonna feel that way. Yeah, so again, speaking yeah. for myself, uh, one quick observation I would make is it's a good idea not to assume that all kernel subsystems maintainers have been following V1 through V8 of your previous patches they may or may not have even remembered your previous Rust talks at previous LPCs. And so having some web page that you could point people at that you know, has a collection of you know, slide decks and code tutorials and easy steps, because I suspect you will find different kernel developers will be in different places. Different maintainers will definitely be in different places. And you know you're going to have to meet them wherever they are, uh, and and this is this really goes back to some of the documentation discussion that we had at the previous forum. Don't assume that all the kernel developers are experts in areas outside their subsystem, because they probably aren't. Many of us really do have to specialize, just because we don't have enough hours in the day. Right. <clears throat> Thanks. And, uh, to echo something that John said, like you're definitely going to get different responses from different subsystems and yeah, you'll probably get it wrong. And that's usually like, if you go through the wrong tree by accident, that tends to be generally speaking a more forgivable mistake. The bigger deal is like, make sure you get that subsystems maintainers ACK. And then, you know, sometimes they'll say ACK and take it through my tree, ACK to go ahead and take it through your tree the thing that people tend to be a lot less forgiving about is why didn't this have my subsystems act when you're binding to my subsystem? So I would worry more about that one than which tree it happens to go through. That'll, you know, that'll fall out of things eventually. Yeah, we, we have so tried, sorry. Plus one on uh, what John said, I maintain case of test and then I have similar situation of tests and API going together th through other trees and and so something to watch out for and same thing with the axe sometimes you know after a while you it early on you might be looking for axe and such and then after a while you might get into a informal arrangement with the other maintainers so things might be there will be some kind of arrangement but there will be you you're always going to be running to these things especially if you're working in an area that cuts across all the subsystems. So be patient with that process. Um, and then uh, some maintainers don't like patches going through other trees. So you kind of have to maybe have one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and say, hey, it's not like you know it, it, what you're doing, trying to see um, why you want to take something through your tree for maybe good reasons at some times. And you have to kind of work with that process. So be patient with the process. Oh yeah, 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 we try. Yeah, we, we even 
back to the Josh also point there. Um, whatever the tree is, for sure, uh, we should be seeing every every everybody that is involved. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. The question here is uh, not about trying at all to bypass anybody. Why quite the opposite? It's about what whether if some maintainers would like to have the their tree take the patches, it would be even better for us. Especially regarding the next question, which is related. Um, which is the maintainership of that, so the, of the raster abstraction. So if we have, a, a, we are, so we have uh, started writing uh, uh, abstractions for some subsystems, uh, especially Watson and Andreas and others. Um, ideally, let's say, or at least medium long term, uh, but as soon as possible for on our side, we would like that. Sorry, we would like that uh, the subsystem maintainers, the experts on that subsystem, maintain the code. Uh, that they take ownership of the code. So, if I think the first step to that is getting the patches accepted through the tree to begin with, uh, and then uh, we are happy to help them. Uh, mm -hmm. We are happy to, yeah. So, so we've built a, a bunch, a number of, of abstractions. So, the, the first thing that we need is, is for, for the maintainers to review them, of course, because uh, as we all know, the maintainers are the experts and they are the ones who know what uh, needs, needs to go in and should go in. Um, and we are also, as Miguel was saying, happy to, to, to work with other maintainers in building these abstractions for, for uh, their subsystems uh, whenever they decide to do it. Uh, but we'd like to, to see that uh, they will, will maintain it uh, uh, once it goes up. Sorry. Yeah, I, from the graphics subsystem, I'm kind of hoping we get it driven from a slightly different direction. I'm hoping that someone, we, we've had one person who's interested in starting a graphics driver using Rust. And we're encouraging that, but we're hoping that they can drive it into the subsystem as well. There's not so much you guys have to do that work. That you advise them, they become the sort of subsystem expert as well with your help, and then they put their driver in and it just comes through the tree naturally. We don't have to, you know, there'll be a bit of, I'm sure there'll be glue and stuff we have to deal with, but, you know, I'd like to, you know, most subsystems can actually, I don't think you need to drive it from into the subsystem from the, this side. It should come from drivers wanting to use it into the subsystem and having that develop in the subsystem itself. It may be a better way to, yeah, because then you have a, a Rust expert here that's in the subsystem, and you've got Rust experts over here, and you can, you know, come at it from both sides. So it may be a bit of a different dynamic when we actually start merging this driver, you know, looking into merging drivers and stuff. Yeah, yeah, th th that's fair. One thing we'd like to say is that we're available. Like, if, if let's say somebody wants to write a driver for some subsystem, right, and then maybe that subsystem uh, maintainer doesn't like the idea of having Rust there, right? We're saying that we're available to 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 help and discuss and and do these things. Um, yeah. But uh, we we got approached uh, we got approached by a couple of uh, uh, companies or people let's say uh, about hey I want to start using uh, uh, Rust uh, how, how do I do that for my uh, for my uh, subsystem right uh, and yeah the answer is please go ahead we can help but uh, if you like to even take maintainers of it from the beginning that's even better for us <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah. yeah this is not necessarily going to be a sustainable approach indefinitely. But at least for now, as long as you continue to have the bandwidth to like review and help with Rust code everywhere in the tree, I'm hoping the maintainer's entry for Rust in the kernel literally has a like star.rs in it so that literally any Rust code going through the kernel gets CC'd so that you can at least have the opportunity to look over it and say like, hey, you know, since you're, we're all still learning Rust in the kernel, then here's some patterns that might have made this code a little bit better. That kind of a thing. That might not scale forever, but hey, let's do things that don't scale as long as we don't have as much code in the kernel. Yeah, so, uh, it will be hard for us to, to um, monitor everything, right, yeah. and, and review everything. Right. Uh, but so, but yeah. we, already the things we are getting in the, in, the, in the repository we have, where we put everything. So the past series that we sent, is uh, it's basically it's, it's a subset of uh, of everything that other things that are pending that we have pull requests by different people that are submitting things, but we didn't have the chance or the the expertise so far to, to review everything. So so there is already things that are coming, uh, and it's it's a lot of things that are coming. So you may not necessarily be reviewing like the kernel content of all of those patches, but like there are a lot of. Um, addresses and similar that get CC'd in the kernel where they're just doing scoped review on certain things. Like you CC Linux API if you're adding new API surface anywhere in the kernel. And it doesn't mean they're reviewing the subsystem specific bits of that. But like, even if we need to make a second list for Rust in the kernel, like here's the fire hose list that gets copied on every Rust patch. 
at least some people may look over that and start, you know, reviewing aspects of the Rust usage and trying to help out with that. Yeah, yeah. It would be good if we actually had uh, uh, Rust uh, developers, like developers of, 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 of uh, the compiler, also uh, watch that list and, and, and help. This is why it. I'm asking to make sure that happens, yes. Yeah. I think uh, we will have a lot of interested Rust users who would love to, like, take a look at that and volunteer, like, hey, go take a look at this. You don't have to be a kernel expert. If you're a Rust expert, you may be able to help. Yeah. In fact, we got uh, already a few people that join us as Rust experts and not kernel experts or developers, and they have been very, very helpful. Uh, uh, Gary, uh, Benno. Yeah, they provide great uh, feedback. Yeah. yeah, so the experience has, has been good there. Um, yeah, but, John but as well. Yeah. A, a lot of the, 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 the more intricate work uh, of, of exposing safe abstractions for, for the subsystems involves understanding the, the subsystems uh, better, right? Uh, so it takes a lot of effort to to review the minutia of, of these abstractions, right? Uh, and, and that's why I feel it's more like a, um, uh, it has to be a collaboration rather than Absolutely. just us uh, like looking over and then giving suggestions, right? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we can go to other topics, additional topics. Uh, the first one that we have here, we, we don't need to, they are not prioritized or anything. Uh, we, it's, it's, they are topics, we have two slides with uh, some topics. Um, the first one is splitting the kernel crate. As I said, the kernel crate, for those of you that don't know, is the one that has all the Rust uh, abstractions that we are talking about. Um, for the moment, all of them are in that crate, which uh, a crate in, in Rust is the compilation, the translation unit uh, of the compiler, uh, which yeah, it works for now, but probably we want uh, that, for example, instead of having, because also right now we have all the, all the code in the Rust folder, the, the root of the, the repository, um, but probably we want to write the subsistent code and the subsistent abstractions in their own folder, just like, uh, just like with the C. Uh, and for doing that, we will also have to manage uh, uh, the dependencies between uh, the crates around the kernel. Um, so yes, there is some work to be done there. Uh, yeah, if somebody wants to discuss about that, uh, yeah. Yeah. So 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 one one thing uh, uh, we thought about doing for 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 dependency is actually try to formalize uh, this 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 dependency graphs uh, uh, within the kernel. So uh, our thought is to do something like when you define a new a new crate or uh, abstractions for for a given subsystem. Is for you to actually specify who can use those those abstractions, right? Uh, and then if somebody, uh, if, if some component uh, is, is is added, uh, uh, you would have to 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 learn about the, the the addition and allow them to 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 use these these components that we're defining. Uh, we actually are planning to do this even when we uh, split the kernel crate uh, for something like um, there will be a crate where uh, the C uh, 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 bindings. Are visible. We don't want those to be accessible to. Um, I have it here. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So so we run this tool bind gen uh, to generate these these bindings. Uh, all these calls, like calling into C, is inherently unsafe from uh, uh, Rust perspective. So we don't want those to be exposed directly to leaf modules uh, in the kernel. Uh, but we want those to be exposed. We need those to be exposed. In fact. Uh, to subsystems because that's how the subsystems will interact with 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 the C side, the, their C side. Uh, so we want to do something like there will be a module, a crate uh, that is uh, this binding crate, uh, but it's only accessible to subsystems. It's not accessible to drivers and modules uh, in general, leaf modules. Um, and yeah, so 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 this is this is our plan, and this is mimicking some other experience we've we've, we've had with with other build systems, where you you declare these uh, dependencies. Uh, and this also was, was uh, something that uh, Greg brought up. In, in, in the talk we had a couple of days ago, I said we were exposing, for example, uh, consuming file objects. So from the kernel, you could like open a file and read and write to, 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 to files. And Greg was like, oh, I don't, I don't want that to be available to, to drivers in general. Uh, but if you look, there, there are some drivers like ASMBD who actually need that functionality. Um, so the idea would be to define a crate like this that allows you to do these sorts of things with files. Uh, but those uh, that crate would not be widely available only on a case by case basis like ksmbd or the 9p server or something like that um, so this is uh, sort of the plan we have um, for for the rust side um, yeah if you have feedback on that or if you think we should uh, look into c to do something similar uh, perhaps something we should 
look into look into yeah yeah it's, it's that kind of uh, improvement that we there are several improvements over uh, during the months we have been working on the raw side uh because we had like let's say a bit more freedom or, or we were thinking about new things uh for example this idea about the managing the, the dependency and the visibility between uh, modules some of those things we may want to apply also to see and could be interesting projects on their own right uh, yeah. but we want to make as far as possible we want to make it independent orthogonal to the rust uh, uh yeah the next one that we have here is uh, tool chain requirements uh defining a minimum rust compiler version and especially in particular the, the when that is possible uh, when we don't have any more uh, unstable features uh, and the cadence of upgrades of that uh, minimum version. So as you know, as you know, for for GCC, etc. Um, well, GCC is I think right now in GCC five the minimum version. Uh, Clang is eleven, if I'm correct. Um, right now we are upgrading the Rust compiler because anyhow we need to use uh, the unstable feature. So whether we upgrade or not, it really doesn't change much. So we are upgrading until the point where we have all the unstable features uh, covered and we can start compiling the code with only a stable feature which means which means that rust the rust uh, teams the compiler the language etc uh, promise that there is backward compatibility 100 uh, percent backwards compatibility so the discussion here would be or this point is uh, about when we reach that point how often we want to upgrade the the, the rust compiler do we want to do something uh, as slow as uh, gcc i mean as slow as upgrading gcc uh, do we want something more uh, less years basically between the release of a compiler and the last time we, we support it, like in, in LLVM, it's uh, less time, um, at least for now. Uh, so yeah, discussing a bit the, the cadence, if somebody has ideas about that, or, or do you think we should establish, for example, a minimum number of years or a fixed number of years, and then we, yeah. Uh, I think on the tool chain version thing, and as you say, like there's a way to go before features are stabilized and we can, you know, continue to use the same version. But the constant upgrade of the version required is actually a bit of a pain at the moment. And perhaps something like, you know, at the very least, you want to be able to use a compiler that is in a distro repository, not something you have to download a nightly or stable compiler from, from Rust up or something. And I don't know. I don't think we have to go back as far as, you know, GCC5, um, but there are definitely, you know, we have on the KUnit side some uh, code coverage things that broke after GCC6 that we haven't fixed yet. Um, certainly something like target the compiler available in Debian stable or something, you know, that's going to be pretty horrific from a Rust point of view where people are used to using more new things, but uh, I think we want to, once things are stable, support relatively old compilers yeah yeah for sure we, we don't want to do it uh, just for fun it's, uh, unless there is something coming in the rust compiler or the rust language sorry that we really really want to use for some reason uh, uh, we don't the idea is not to upgrade just for the fun of upgrading yeah that's for sure it's Absolutely. about the question of how, whether we should establish any 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 cadence like okay say five years we wait five years uh, and then we upgrade to the we establish like a yeah, five year delay or whatever yeah, I think um, tying it to distro cadence is going to make a lot of sense because the number one reason for the minimum version is going to be what's available in distros where people expect to build kernels. I think the huge open question is going to be which kinds of distros because there's a very big difference between it's available in latest Ubuntu versus it's available in latest stable Debian versus it's available in latest stable RHEL. And that... Uh, I think that's going to determine a lot about which portions of support, and that's a balance that we need to maintain. I don't think anybody thinks we're going to upgrade every 6, 12, 18 weeks, but the question is, do we upgrade every two years, every three years, every five years, every 10 years? And I think that uh, there is a lot of hope that it isn't necessarily on the 5 or 10 end. Exactly. Exactly. So we hope, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we have quite similar problem uh, in the Grab project, and we are discussing this. My opinion at this point is that we should only upgrade uh, when we need new features from the compiler. So we support 
the lowest minimal version which provides us uh, recurrent features. And we, if, if at some point we think that we need a feature from the newer compiler, then we, then we bump the recurrent version for the compiler. I'm not sure that this is the best approach, but I think that it is the most convenient at this point, I think. That would be similar to the GCC approach, right? Yeah. Where we upgrade when we really want something new. From... Somebody back. The other, the other thing we do uh, for some things in the kernel is we gate the, uh, if there's a particular kernel feature which needs a new compiler feature, we gate the kernel feature on that uh, compiler feature being available. So there, there are some things that have way, way, way newer minimum toolchain versions than uh, GCC5 or whatever. Um, and depending on why you need, you're, somebody wants to use a new version of Rust, that might be a viable approach as well. That's going to be especially true for things like security features and architecture support and similar. Like, yeah, if you want to turn on security features, you need a compiler that has support for those security features. And if you want to build your entire kernel guaranteeing that every line of code had that feature, you do have to depend on a compiler that has that feature. I think that's the kind of thing that makes people want, not want to wait five years. One, one sort of meta comment here is uh, and again, this goes to don't assume all uh, kernel developers understand what's going on with Rust. Um, part of, you know, in terms of the whole, you know, should we be targeting Debian stable versus RHEL versus Ubuntu stable versus, you know, bleeding edge Fedora? I don't know how to make that engineering trade off because I don't know what Rust features are available and what time scales and why we might need them. Right. And similarly, when you were talking about splitting the kernel crate and, you know, how do we hide certain abstractions from certain modules, I don't know what's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And it may very well be that one of the things you can do that will help is to provide a menu of options to kernel developers so they can understand, you know, how painful is it, for example, to move functions around between different crates? Mm -hmm. How can we make it so that you have to go through a bit more effort if you want to use some of these unsafe findings. And there may be on a case by case basis a reason why a device driver needs to do that, but maybe it triggers higher level review or something, right? I don't know what mechanisms are available. And so therefore, you know, when you ask me these questions, you know, my first answer is, I don't know. You need to give me some trade-offs and then we can evaluate the trade-offs across, you know, what we believe our development requirements are, right? And I think it'll take a while before we can actually get to the point where we're going to be able to have these conversations very easily because I suspect many of us are missing, I know I am certainly missing much of the necessary background. Yeah, that, that's very fair, yeah. Yeah, some, some 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 of the things we we, we talked about before we we give a little bit more detail in 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 the session we had a couple of days ago uh, and and here yeah we have we're very uh slim on, on details because uh, we thought the intention was just to have the discussion or at least to, yeah. to raise the point for yeah. future discussion etc hi um i've had some mixed experiences with bisecting and the rust compiler where when you try and build something that's old with today's compiler Today's compiler decides, no, what, what that old code was is unsafe, it's, it's changed its mind and it won't compile anymore. Do we foresee these sort of problems and what sort of guarantees will we have about bisectability? We actually have an item yeah. about bisection on the next, the next, uh, the next slide. slide. Oh. Uh, it's slightly different, but yeah. Slightly different, but a problem yeah. with bisection. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, but, but, but let's, let's try to, so, so yeah, there's, yeah. there's, there's that, that may be a problem, but but that, that wouldn't be specific to, to to Rust, right? Like one 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 thing that Rust has to to help with that is is additions, right? You can you can say things like, um, I want to compile with the 2018 edition or uh, some, some some other edition, um, and and um, one of the things we do in 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 the make files and and the infrastructure to build things is we specify what what the requirements are in terms of addition and things like those, uh, so. We hope that there will be some uh, 
this will help a bit, right? Maybe not solve all the problems about the, the, the safety and, and things like that. If, if there is a bug, also another point is that if there is a bug in the compiler where the borrow checker, for example, is not catching something, and, and, and I would expect or I would hope that if we are supporting that compiler version for Rust, the Rust upstream would uh, 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 provide a, a, a point one release of the compiler. They do sometimes when they find this kind of, yeah. right, Josh? Josh probably knows, uh, can answer much better than me. But basically, I would expect that if a given Rust C version is very popular to compile a kernel, then, and they found a, a bug, a really critical bug there, so that we, I would expect or I would hope that the Rust uh, teams give us a, a point one release of that compiler fixing that particular bug. Yeah, right. um, to uh, add to that as well, like you mentioned having issues with particular types of code, I think this is absolutely something that will get substantially better when we get to the point where we compile with 100% stable Rust. Like the kernel is currently experiencing a flavor of Rust that is not what the vast majority of Rust users do because it's using so many nightly features that it has to in order to prototype and work at all. The concept of like, I used a newer compiler and now my code doesn't compile is something that never happens in stable Rust by definition that like we do not break existing stable code. And once you're on 100% stable, I expect we're going to start including kernel trees in the uh, system we use called Crater that tests every piece of Rust code that's uh, public and that we're aware of so that every single new release of the compiler will have test runs that compiles tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of projects, including the kernel, and verifies, yep, still works all the way back to every version that's been used. It would not be hard to add not just latest kernel, but like last 30 releases of the kernel into Crater, for example. And I would expect us to do that. And then when they do have breaking changes, then it's a new addition. Right, and that's that's the thing where you say like I, I'll use some previous edition, uh, and then the expectation is that everything will just work. Right, exactly. You have to opt into I want the behavior of the language to change, and if you don't, then your code keeps working forever. Yeah, the additions for for those that don't know, back to the Ted's comment about the the context, the additions are basically like the C standard uh, uh, versions, let's say, or releases. Right. Uh, one one thing that's kind of coming up is. Um, are we, is the kernel going to be a hermetic build or are, uh, like, are we vendoring crates or, or constructing our own versions of um, well-known crates or are we going to be using Rust up in, oh, oh I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't look at the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Think, it it <laughs> seems like a good point. Yeah, yeah no, it's completely though. fine. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so, for example, what, what, so let me give very uh, a quick, so what we vendor right now is vendor, really. So, so there is the, the core crate, uh, which comes from the standard library of Rust, that we pick from the, from the compiler itself, so it's the right version, it's the right version that the, it's the version that the compiler needs, basically. So that is tied to the compiler, so to speak. Alloc is the, the library that handles, uh, contains some data structures that need allocations, uh, and we are vendoring, or we are copying basically a, a subset of the of the of the alloc crate uh, because we don't need first of all we don't need all of it and but most importantly because we needed some extra things uh, so we are doing that but for the moment it's just that we are not taking other uh, we we don't we don't do vendoring of uh, third party crate let's say uh, there is a, a point here in this slide which is should we allow or should we try to reuse uh, code that people has written uh, in the Rust community. There's a lot of useful crates that uh, we have some contributors that told us like, oh, really, I want to use that crate or I want to use this other crate because maybe they come from user space Rust and they know and they use those, those crates and they are useful because they are no STD crates, which means uh, they are crates that don't require the standard library. They can be used in an embedded context, let's say, and that code can be reused up to some degree. I mean, you cannot reuse everything. Sometimes maybe you need to do adjustments. It's a case by case. Uh, uh, has to be case by case uh, analyzed. But yeah. So in user space, people are used to to using third parties uh, crates, third party crates, and it's very easy for you to automatically download and build those things in user space. We we don't support that uh, at the moment uh, in in the kernel, but we've we've received requests from people to to do something like that, and this is one of the topics we'd like to 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 discuss here. Um, we actually have uh, uh, some. 
internal people asking for this and pushing for this, but and some people are just against it yeah. altogether. Uh, um, this is a little bit of a, our perspective. We started using uh, Rust in the Mesa project, a graphics driver user space project. Uh, we put a hard no on using crates at runtime because we, when you go to distros, it's, that they want to build offline space. So we just said, no, but we haven't quite decided, I don't think, on whether we're going to vendor in crates, but I don't think we're against that. But we're definitely went hard now on the runtime bringing crates in. Yeah, so, so our decision had been a hard no too, and this is where we are at the moment. But we're getting people asking for this and pushing hard for this, right? That's why we sort of brought this up as, as, as a point for discussion here. We want to hear from you guys. How, how do you feel? Uh, uh, should we try to support it or? or yeah, we, we are trying to, before we, man, since the beginning, more than one year ago or two years ago, we, we tried to be as close to the seaside as possible and not do anything uh, uh, that was not really, really needed. So that's where we are in, in most of our decisions. But now is the time where we may, maybe we need to start asking, like, do we need this? We could do something better. I, I'd say s stick with that hard no. Um, if you've ever looked at, for example, the, FreeBSD kernel tree, they've got all sorts of other projects in there that they link in because if you, you know, compile some C files into an object, then you can link against it and you know, it's a static object. It works, but it introduces a lot of uh, lack of uniformity. And uh, kernel code now, it's not completely uniform, lots of different coding styles, et cetera, but at least there's some uniformity. And this allows some latitude in doing things in particular kernel ways that are optimized for how the kernel works, like things like uh, RCU patterns being everywhere. And because Rust as an ecosystem and a movement is so much larger than the, the kernel itself, or so much more diverse, I should say, sure, you have a lot of user space programmers who want to use these crates again, but there might be a certain value in, in them maybe not being able to do that so easily, having to learn about the differences of kernel development that you can't just take some user space code, or if you intend to do that, you have to you know, really take it apart and understand how it can function in the kernel context. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. clear that we can take arbitrary crates at the moment, right? They'll, for example, most of them, at least the ones that I looked at and, and, and uh, um, for, for, for something else, they all, for example, assume that if you allocate memory and there, you have no memory, then it's okay to panic, right? It's not something that is, would be acceptable. Um, so, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, we there, there are others like, like a proc macros and Rust, which are like compiler, compiler plugins for code generation, okay? Those really run on the host. They don't run in the final kernel limits. They are just, just compiler plugins. That, uh, so those kind of stuff are, some of them are, can be really useful for the kernel and they don't end on the, on the kernel limits. Uh, so some of those are also one candidate, the, the first candidates that we were considering, basically. They have nothing to do with the kernel. It's just facilities to use easily the language. I am. Um... I think there's a lot of value in supporting vendoring of third-party crates insofar as you have to actually drop them into the kernel tree and they need to go through review. If you actually want to add them, they'd be part of a patch in a tree. They'd go through a review process and that would provide much better opportunity. As much as people are going to push for it, I genuinely do not think you should even have experimental support for pull it straight from the network. There are standard tools for grab it from the network and drop it into this directory. Cargo vendor is really trivial to run. Like add support for using stuff in a vendor directory. And if people can't go to the trouble of dropping something in there and they really want to get it straight from the network, that seems like too little friction and there would be no vetting of that code. So a comment from like, because uh, I work on uh, Rust 2 RPM and Rust packaging in, in Fedora. Uh, it's really no biggie to have dependencies of on crates. And it's in general much more preferable to have uh, to depend on crates, which are packaged as distro packages then, than to have vendored code. I mean, there might be good reasons to uh, vendor code, but uh, Distro build is not one of those reasons, certainly. Uh, I mean, before my comment was just talking about importing third party code, but I mean, if we're talking about crates going through cargo and pulling these down off the network, uh, you got to consider the dependency trees and 
uh, the general impossibility of auditing this code and understanding massive trees that sometimes come down when you pull in a crate. I mean, if we open that box, you know, say only no STD crates because nothing else will work or only certain well-behaved ones, we're still going to have trees of dependencies coming off of this. And the whole thing becomes then hard to manage. And it's, it's, even if we vendor those, then it's in some, you know, vendor directory, which begs the question, well, if we have some new interesting library code, why isn't this in, you know, slash lib or, I mean, why can't we take the bits of Rust that we want from elsewhere that are useful? You know, other people than the kernel write useful algorithms, of course. Why can't we pull these in and put them someplace that makes sense organizationally rather than just here's a massive tree of dependencies in some vendor directory? Yeah, we are actually with you. Uh, so we'd actually like your help. When people come asking for us, we'll redirect them to you to, to help us uh, <laughs> convince them that this is not a good idea. Uh, they're very pushy. So I think... I don't think anybody is going to want to drop like 50 crates in a dependency tree directly into a vendor director. I think that would be an incredibly bad idea. I think on the other hand, the kernel today currently vendors a few bits of C code from well-known places. For example, there is more or less a vendored copy of libz standard in the kernel in order to do Z standard compression. And libz standard upstream did a bunch of work to make sure that the code could more or less be dropped verbatim into the kernel. That's the, the standard I would expect vendored crates to be held to is we can use this unmodified and there's no issue with it. And short of that, like the reason I'm suggesting that it is actually valuable to do it as a unit is for exactly the thing that somebody from over on that side of the room mentioned of that distros want to be able to extract that vendor code and say, we don't actually want the bit from the vendor directory. We want to use the bit that we've packaged in our distribution. And if you know it's unmodified, then you can very easily factor it out and share that code and not get it from the vendor directory and just say, well, it's the same as the copy we already have in our distro. Yeah. It, it may very well be that um, what we're doing is we're bridging cultural differences between, say, user space Rust developers and it may be helpful to have some documentation that explains the requirements, right? Because otherwise, it will feel like we're making arbitrary restrictions. And so explaining to people, for example, that it is an absolute requirement for some, uh, some release uh, environments that you'll be able to do a build without access to the external network, right? Explain to people that we want a, current, uh, a specific kernel commit ID to absolutely reflect um, you know, the same set of bits, right? We need reproducible builds. And so that means for bisectability purposes, we don't wanna like randomly drag in the latest version of some car Rust crate that changes how that would have behaved when it was built two years ago, right? And I think if we, sort of explain it in terms of requirements, then it will be a little bit easier for people to understand why things are the way they are. The other thing about the vendor directory is if somebody pulls in something, you know, they just do cargo vendor, whatever, and it results in a kernel patch, which is, you know, 3000 lines of code because they just pulled in a dozen different crates. When that goes through the review process, a kernel maintainer will probably say, hard no, I can't review you know, this 50,000 line thing because there's all this magic code that just appeared. You know, we aren't quite as trusting as some other people are. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's one minute left. You want to summarize, guys? Yeah, that we, we, we welcome any help on all these decision points. We, we are trying to do uh, what is best for, for the kernel. We don't have any hard... Uh, <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, we, we welcome all these. Uh, we are just asking because, uh, yeah, we, we want to hear your, your opinion and, and, and do what the kernel community thinks is the best way to go forward. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming everybody. and listening. Thanks.